Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Somerville. We invite you to stand for praise and worship. That is the truth. Praise you, Lord. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Hallelujah, my weapon is a melody, I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Hope will arise, death is defeated. 
worthy of our praise this morning no matter what we're walking through father god we are choosing god to lift our voices loud to you god to declare that you are good father god that we don't have to wait until our storm is over we want to praise you in the middle of our trials god we want father to rise up in faith god to be filled with hope that comes from you and you alone because of what you have done for us on the cross, God. We are victorious. We are overcomers because of what you have done on the cross, Lord. And so, Father, wherever we find ourselves this morning, God, I pray that you would help us to turn our eyes towards the cross this morning. In the power of Jesus Christ, we love you. We praise you.
fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good. time. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's a refuge and a hiding place. His thoughts and his plans for us are good. We can trust him in the unknowing. We can place our faith and know that God is sovereign. Lord, this morning we thank you for your steadfastness, for your faithfulness for your unchanging nature and for your love that is never failing. Oh, Lord, thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and giving us a place in your kingdom. Father, we love you so much. And God, we are, we are desiring, God, for you to do a work in our church, in our hearts, in our lives, God, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. God, we need you desperately. I pray, Father, that we would be unmoved, that we would not be shaken by the trials and the tribulations of this world, but that we keep our eyes fixed on you, the sovereign one, the one who alone is holy and just and good, We love you, God. 
We thank you for your presence in this time of worship. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's how you change the world. Thank you for listening to Change the World with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville. It is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with today's message, here's Pastor Vic. Let's pray. That is our prayer this morning, God, that that we would be found blameless, that we would be found faithful in regards to Your Word and Your statutes, Lord. That Your tender mercies would come upon us, Lord. That we would delight in Your judgments. Your judgments are good and right. That we would delight in Your faithfulness and Your loving kindness. God, we pray now as we open up Your Word to study this morning. Just pray for an extra dose of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We implore your presence. We just ask, God, that you would do something good in our hearts today, that you would speak a mighty word, and that your spirit would go forth from this place. We offer this time to you now. We ask for your blessing and your anointing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, let's all turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7 as we continue our journey through God's Word. Paul last week communicated to the Corinthians and warned them of the fact that their lives as Christians were full of compromise. Compromise with the world. They had fully embraced and had fully received God's grace, but their lives didn't reflect as much. Though they were professing Christianity, they were still walking in their sin. They were still seeking the the desires of their flesh. They were unequally yoked, as Paul put it, with the world, and thus seeking to foster this relationship and this friendship between darkness and light. And Paul says, I plead with you, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Do not seek to yoke righteousness with lawlessness because as, as Paul said, what accord does Christ have with Satan? And so Paul pleaded with them in what was a call to holiness. And he quoted Isaiah chapter 52 where God says to his people, come out from among the world. Be separate. Do not be involved. Do not touch what is unclean. you you, you got to be in the world, but do not be of the world. You be separate. You be holy. That's a command straight from the mouth of God. And then God lets us know that whoever obeys that command, there's a glorious promise that's attached to it. You unyoke yourself from all that is ungodly. You commit yourself to holiness. And God says, I will receive you. The world is going to reject you but the God of the universe will receive you. Uh, You know, we all want to be liked and we all want to have friends and nobody likes feeling lonely, but sometimes the Christian walk in a dark world surrounded by heathens, surrounded by unbelievers, you're going to feel lonely sometimes. You're going to feel friendless. But I'll take the friendship of God over a whole planet full of sinners. Because in a human life, God plus no one equals everything. And so God says to the person whose life is set apart, the person who is committed to godly living, to the Christian outcast, to the person that feels like I don't belong anywhere, nobody likes me, nobody accepts me, because of your faith, because of your walk, to that person... Anyone feeling lonely and rejected by the world, God says, I will receive you. And not only that, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and and my daughters. That's the glorious promise. You might lose a few friends, but what you're going to gain is infinitely better, and that's greater intimacy with God. And that's what this is all about, these middle chapters of, of 2 Corinthians, coming out of lukewarmness, coming out of Uh, compromised living, coming out of social, uh, worldly Christianity and coming into a deeper uh, and and, and more intimate fellowship with God. 
In verse 1 of chapter 7, Paul says, Therefore, having these promises, or now that these glorious promises have been revealed to us, here's the application. Here's how you apply this to your life. Here here are the steps that need to be taken or the action that follows true faith. He says, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Notice that Paul says us. He's including himself. Paul hasn't reached some plateau of spiritual greatness. He hasn't arrived spiritually. Well, he has now, but not when he wrote this letter. But, you know, you, you get the point. The, the point is, is not one of us this side of heaven are, are ever going to get to the point where we don't need to grow more spiritually. To where we say, well, I got no more sin to contend with in my life. I'm all good. I'm, I'm completely pure and holy. The, the, the fact is that the opposite is true. Because what you learn, as Paul did... What you learn, the closer you get to God, the more sin He reveals in your life. And so you're constantly, constantly having to cleanse yourself of of filthiness. Now, as I said last week, this is what Paul's talking about here. This is not in the context of salvation. Or you and I being able to cleanse our our own self, you know, from from our sin to the degree that we earn or or merit righteousness. That kind of cleansing is, is... only God can accomplish that in our lives. As it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's, that's one aspect. That's the first aspect of, of cleansing. That relates to salvation. It's something that's a gift from God and something that we cannot earn or merit uh, or, you know, in our own works or whatever or play any part in. But, but as it relates to what Paul's talking about in, in these middle chapters here, particularly here in verse 7, the context is, is you and I facilitating greater intimacy and, and, and deeper fellowship with God. Once we've been saved, once we're going to heaven, once we've been you know, forgiven from our sin, there's another aspect of cleansing that needs to happen. And it's, and it's an aspect that God comes in and does in partnership with us. In other words, there, there's a cleansing that continues to happen in our lives that God does in agreement with our will, that God does in agreement with our efforts. And, and it's a choice. It's... it's It's an area here where Paul wants us to know that we bear great spiritual responsibility. That's why in this context, Paul doesn't say, you know, we're all saved, so let's just all sit back and let God cleanse us. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. As he says here, perfecting holiness. And so we can't contribute one tiny little thing to the salvation process, but what he's saying is is that we can and must contribute to the purification process. God wants to prepare us for heaven. That's what this is all about. He wants to prepare us for heaven on this side of heaven. He wants to purify our uh, hearts, but he gives us um, some responsibility in that. And so, how do we perfect holiness, as Paul is talking about here? How do we cleanse ourselves from all filthiness? How do we become sanctified? Or how does this all end up with you and I having purified hearts? Well, Paul already told us last week, by separating ourselves from the world, forsaking sin, forsaking uh, and, and dying to the flesh. To put it in simple, applicable terms... If you will purify your eyes, ears, hands, and feet, God will purify your heart. And, and that was the problem with the Corinthians. It's the same problem with, with most of Christianity today. People want to give their hearts to Christ, but they continue to give their eyes, ears, hands, and feet to the world and to the seeking of the flesh. Maybe there's just, you know, you can be talking about just this overall apathetic attitude in the church towards sin today. Maybe you're here and there's just one sin in your life that keeps rearing its its ugly head. Regardless, 
People who keep confessing the same sin over and over, it's because they've never cleansed themselves. They haven't done their part, beginning with uh, taking the steps that are necessary to alleviate the temptation in your life. Man, if you just cannot overcome pornography, no matter how much you try, you ought not have a computer in your house. You ought not have a, a smartphone. You ought not have any of those things that help facilitate the temptation. That's what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. It's better to lose you know, your, your hand or your foot or your eye or, 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 or whatever and go to heaven rather than to, you know, your body be cast into hell. Of course, he was speaking figuratively. But, but that's the point here. How can God purify your heart when your eyes and your ears and your hands and your feet keep indulging in that which God has forbidden? And you'll, you'll be surprised. I'll sit in counseling and you'll be surprised at how many people continue to blame God for their sin. Where they say, well, I keep praying that God will take this away, but so far, He hasn't. Why won't God deliver me from this sin and, and, and this bondage? And my response to that is, well, let's, let's talk about, let's go over the steps that you have taken to purify your eyes and your ears and your hands and your feet bef before we start blaming God for your heart. Once God has taught you how to tie your shoes, we all had to teach our kids how to tie their shoes. But once God teaches you how to tie your shoes, figuratively speaking, He's not going to tie them for you. That's your responsibility. That's part of your partnership in this thing. And so when we walk around with our shoes untied, meaning we fail to get rid of the things that are leading to the temptation, we neglect to, to do all that is necessary to keep us from tripping. You walk around with your shoes untied, you can't blame God when you fall. And, and it's not just the filthiness of the flesh that Paul says we are to cleanse ourselves from. It's also the filthiness of the Spirit that needs to be purged, which is, among many things, self-righteousness, uh, legalism, bitterness, hatred. Paul talked about having a lack of grace for others, having received the grace of God in vain, where, yes, God, give me all your grace, and we pray for grace, but then we have no grace for anyone else where the grace is flowing uh, vertically, but then we don't extend it horizontally. Self-serving. All these things, they defile our spirit and in many ways are more dangerous than the sins of the flesh. So let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. And this is not you and I setting a goal or striving to reach a goal where, you know, I eventually rid myself of, of all that is evil. That's just part of it. That's, that's the law. That was living under the law of Moses. The law of love that Jesus established in the new covenant is much greater and much more broad. Right? So it's not that I'm just, you know, trying to cleanse myself of all that is evil. I'm trying to, to, to get to a point in my life where everything that I do and everything that I say is good. That I'm bringing pleasure to God. That I'm, that I'm, my life, my words, my actions, everything is, is, is pleasing to God. And, and, and why is that? What's my motivation behind that? Remember chapters 5 and 6 where Paul talked about it. Like I strive for goodness. I strive for holiness. And, 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 and I do it for one reason. I do it because I love God so much that I want my life to bring Him pleasure. I want my life to bring Him glory. That's what brings about godliness in a human life. I don't care how legalistic you are, how, how religious you think you are, there is nothing but a great love for God that, that, that's going to produce holiness in your life. And Paul puts it here, I, 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 I do it in the fear of God. And in, and in the, the last chapter, remember Paul said, close your hearts to the world. Now, verse 2, he says, open your hearts to us. He's talking about the apostles. He's talking about the, the, the church leadership, the, the teachers of the word. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. 
These are some of the things that Paul and, and some of the other apostles were getting accused of. He says, I do not say this to condemn. Paul's not, you know, this is not to lay a big guilt trip on, on, on anybody. But his purpose is, for I have said before, that you are in our hearts. So we love you. That's why. It's like you love your kids. You, you discipline your kids because you love them. And the Bible says if you don't discipline, you, you hate them. Paul says to die together and live together. Verse 4, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. Paul wanted the Corinthian church to know that, yeah, I've, I've been hard on you. God's word is hard on us. You know, it goes against everything that we want to hear as it relates to our flesh. Someone said to me one time, you know, I love Calvary Chapel, but man, I just can't live up to that Calvary Chapel standard. And I'm like, it's not the Calvary Chapel standard. It's the standard of the Word of God. And I'm not going to apologize for holding you accountable to God's best and God's Word. So Paul says, you know, it's hard. The Word of God is hard. Being rebuked. Chastened. It's hard. But to the same degree that I have rebuked you, Paul says, I have bragged about you. Remember uh, the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians? It was just a scathing rebuke from one end of that letter to the other. I mean, 16 chapters of, of just one sin after another being exposed and strongly condemned. But then word got back to Paul. From, from Titus that his first letter for the most part had been well received in Corinth and that the church in Corinth had begun to, to heed Paul's instructions and were taking corrective measures. And so Paul says, I am filled with comfort to the point of, of notice, I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. In other words, when we have the right perspective as Paul did the reason that we can be joyful in all our tribulation is because we know and we understand that the fruit of the tribulation, what comes of it, will always far outweigh the tribulation itself. See, God just heard that. I'm going to say it again. We all go through trials and tribulation, but for the Christian... The fruit of the tribulation, what comes of it, will always far outweigh the tribulation itself. As Morgan's uh, commentary puts it, for the Christian who is eternally minded, anyone who lives you know, with this heavenly perspective will understand that no circumstance of personal affliction can dim the gladness of seeing souls grow in the grace in the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's how we don't go, grow weary in doing good. As the, again, being a Christian is hard. Being in ministry is hard. But we keep the proper perspective. And I know that sometimes as a Christian, I know that I'm in a battle where I have a fierce enemy. I know that there are going to be times when I get cut and I get bruised and I get speared and I get, I get battered. But all that stuff seems like nothing when I realize that, that it has produced people getting saved and going to heaven. Who cares about a cut or a bruise? Who cares about any of that when I see people getting saved and going to heaven as a result of my pain? Not only you know, how it affects others, but how it affects me and my own spiritual well-being and my own walk. When I see that it has produced you know, my own spiritual growth and, and, and spiritual maturity, not, not only is the tribulation worth it, as Paul says here, I can rejoice in it. Well, you go on a missions trip. Man, you go, you fly to Africa. You know, there's, some, there's a lot of self-sacrifice in that. There's a lot of, you know, I remember when we went to Costa Rica a couple of times we went. You know, it was a uh, ever how many six, seven hours on a plane, and then another six, seven hours in a in a van, and and a couple hours on a boat. And you know, you you do roll family kids camp. You know, your your body and your your emotions are are going to be beat up pretty good 
during that week. And a lot of you did roll family. Do you know, you're, you're going to get, spiritually, you're going to get beaten up that week. But at the end of it all, you see the fruit. And you see those lives that you touched and that your pain facilitated. You see those little lives. You see what it has produced. And it could be because of you that ten of those kids are now going to spend all of eternity with Jesus Christ. So who cares about the pain? Who cares about the cuts and the bruises? It's worth it. And so I expect more people to be signed up for Royal Family Kids Camp next year. Amen. We still have our same, I get $20 per person commission. Just kidding. So, again, I can not only, not only I live with the pain, but boy, I rejoice in it. I can rejoice in it. That's what Paul's doing right now. The proper perspective. Verse 5, for indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Remember, Paul was in Macedonia he, because he had left Troas. He was waiting for Titus to come and to bring him news, to bring a report on how the Corinthians had responded to his first letter, that scathing letter. And he says here, outside were conflicts, inside were fears. You ever send a letter to somebody? Now these days it's, it's email or, or text or Facebook or whatever. But you ever sent a message to somebody where you're having to address something very challenging, very uh, sensitive? Now, it's the reason that, that I've learned not to use text in those, in those regards, but, but I've done it before. But you're texting something very sensitive, something that you're dealing with that you know has the possibility of the other person not receiving it very well. And so you're kind of apprehensive and you hit that sin button, you're like, oh, it's gone. And now I can't get it back. It's gone. And so now you just wait for them to respond. And every five minutes, you're checking your email or you're checking your phone and you're like... What in the world is going on with them? It's been like 12 minutes and they haven't responded yet. And that's where Paul's at right here. He's a nervous wreck. Remember, again, the Lord had opened up doors for him in Troas to be able to, to, to minister greatly to those people there. But Paul had to leave. He couldn't concentrate on Troas because his mind was on the Corinthians and how they were going to respond to his letter. And then finally, Titus comes. He makes it to Macedonia. He delivers to Paul the good news that the Corinthian church was humbled and convicted by his letter. And though, as Paul says, outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Verse 6, nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire. Your earnest desire to make things right in your heart and to make things right in your church. He says, you're mourning. The fact that you were mourning over uh, your sin. Anytime a pastor or a church leader, you're a teacher, whether it's corporately or individually, anytime that God calls, up, calls upon you to, to expose sin or to rebuke sin, the hope, the, the prayer, it, it, is it, it would lead those who you're talking to, that it would lead them to mourning that it would lead them to repentance. It doesn't always go that way. But it always has, you know, the, the potential to go one way or the other. And so Paul was greatly relieved to hear that his rebuke of their sin had brought the Corinthians to, to a place of mourning. Paul says, I was comforted by your zeal for me so that I rejoiced even more. How good it must have been for Paul personally to hear that these Corinthian Christians were not believing all of these false allegations that were being made against him and, and his uh, ministry. How, how good it must have uh, felt for, for him to hear that, you know, these guys aren't, aren't mad at me or they don't like me. You know, I, I don't care who you are. Everybody wants to be liked. You know, if somebody doesn't like me, it bothers me, even if I don't like them. 
But that's the point here. Paul, Paul is like, oh man, it's such a relief to hear, you know, I haven't made a bunch of, of enemies here. So he hasn't, you know, he hasn't had his ministry. He hasn't had uh, himself and in, in, uh, his ministry hasn't been tainted by, you know, some of these false allegations that were going around. The Corinthians were receiving him. It was a relief for him to hear He says, verse 8, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I was having second thoughts about sending it, second thoughts about hitting that send button. He said, For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. In other words, any time that the Holy Spirit reveals sin in our lives, it's when we come to the realization of the grief that we have caused our Father, that we have caused God. Now that comes out of that great love for Him and the great need that I have deep in my soul and in my heart to want to please Him, to bring Him pleasure, to bring Him glory. And when I fail, it breaks my heart. It, it, it takes me to a, a, a place of, of mourning. It produces godly sorrow. That's the point here. Now, what's important is... is the godly sorrow is not as important as what we do with the godly sorrow. Now we can, you know, we, we got two instances in the gospel, both, both Judas and Peter exhibited great sorrow. They both betrayed Jesus uh, and both were sorrowful over the grief that they had caused him. But of course, one repented and one did not. Most people to some degree are sorrowful over their sin and, and unless you're, you know, if you have a conscience at all, unless you're some kind of sociopath, you, you, you feel sorrow over sin. But the problem is, the problem is, most people's sorrow is not greater than their desire to continue in that sin. Yeah, I know I hurt you. And I'm really sorry about that. And I know I brought grief to God's life and, and, and to God's heart and, and you know, Kind of, kind of gets me right here, but not enough to give up the sin and to walk away from, from the sin. Whereas the godly purpose in sorrow is, is very simply that it would lead you to repentance. But sorrow and, and repentance are, are two different things. Saying you're sorry and repenting are two different things. Not the same thing. Anybody can say, I, I, I'm sorry. Sorry is an emotion. Repentance is an action. So repentance is, is I'm, it's a 180. It's where I'm heading in this direction. Here's sin in that direction. God is over here. And I make up my mind. I'm sorry, God. I brought, I brought God such grief. And my heart is filled with, with godly sorrow. And as a result of that, I want to repent. And to repent is, is, is to do a 180, just like this. And now I've turned away. I've forsaken the sin. I'm walking away from the sin. And now I'm walking toward God. And notice I can't walk in the, in the two directions at the same time. You have to choose one or the other. So repentance is, is a change of mind that is evidenced by a change of direction. And Paul says, verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, sorry doesn't produce anything, but that your sorrow led to repentance. So the godly sorrow in your heart, it, it produced exactly what it was designed to produce. And for that, I rejoice, Paul says, for you were made sorry in a godly manner. In other words, it was the truth that made you sorry. There was no hidden agenda. There was no manipulation on, on my part, Paul says. We can stand up here every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, and every Bible study, whatever. We can take God's Word and we can declare the truth and God's Word does what it does. I got a letter in the mail yesterday and I noticed that they'd sent them to everybody in our neighborhood. Um, you know, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's sort of uh, masqueraded. It's, it's got these things that you look at it and you think it's a Christian sort of a church or whatever, but you get down at the very bottom, you know, it's just like the JW 
organization or whatever. And they, they, you know, it says, we're going to send you a pamphlet. And if you read the pamphlet and then you come in and, and we'll share these things with you in regards to truth. And so there's a lot of charade, a lot of manipulation there. When, when, when God's word is not like that at all, it's plain and simple and open for all of the world to see and read and understand and apply to your life. There's no hidden agenda and no manipulation. God's word does what it does. The truth does what it does. So Paul says, I just spoke the truth and allowed the truth to do what the truth was designed to do. He says that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow uh, produces repentance. Now you might want to underline, if you're writing in your Bibles, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words here. For godly sorrow produces repentance. And repentance leading to what? Salvation. Not that repentance is the foundation of our salvation. Faith is. But make no mistake about it, repentance is a necessary component of true faith. In fact, those two things, they go hand in hand. You can't have repentance without true faith. And you can't have true faith without repentance. And thus, we we, we make a huge mistake. We, We all... You know, it's, it's awesome to be able to share the gospel with someone and to lead someone to Christ. And hopefully we all do that. But we, we make a huge mistake when, when, we, when we tell someone that all they need to do in order to be saved is to believe in Jesus. And we know that the, the, the demons believe in Jesus. The devil believes in Jesus. That doesn't mean they're saved. Now, there are verses in the Bible that says, yeah, all you have to do is believe. And so as a, as a, a, a general uh, sense, that is true. But we need to make sure that people understand that, uh, that part of a, of a true belief in Jesus is recognizing that I am a sinner and that I am heading in the wrong direction and that I need to change my course as it relates to sin. So my, my, my faith is to be evidenced by my change of, of course. I believe in Jesus, but what is the evidence that I believe in Jesus? It's my changed life. It, it's the fact that I don't head in that direction anymore. I head in that direction toward the Lord. So it's faith that is evidenced by my change of course, thus repentance. Otherwise, if, if I don't present the gospel in that way if I tell somebody and, and I uh, probably shouldn't say this there's a very very popular pastor out in California he's written many many books some of them we've had to take down from our bookstore M- written many books one of them about 15-20 years ago probably one of the most top selling Christian books of all time uh, you get to the end of that book and, you know, after delivering all this great application, you get to the end of the book, and he says, uh, if you would like to accept Jesus in your heart, I'm going to tell you how to do that. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. If you do, you're going to heaven. Welcome to the Christian family. Not one word about repentance. Not one word. And so, when we present the gospel in that way, it gives the false impression that a person can turn to God without turning away from that which God opposes. So when you're leading someone to Christ, you know, you're out there just peddling get out of hell free cards like this guy was uh, when you neglect to inform them uh, of the necessity of repentance. And, and, And that is exactly why, in my opinion, the church today is full of compromised Christians. Because most churches and most Christians, all they want to talk about now is what we are being saved to. Nobody wants to talk about what what it is that we have been saved and delivered from, which is sin. And so again, it it gives the impression that you can have both, that you can have uh, salvation and sin, that you can have salvation without uh, repentance. Now for any church, uh, a, a church is to be a hospital for sinners. When you pray for our church, we shall we should all be desiring, we should all be praying that God brings sinners through those doors. But but unfortunately, the 
the, the marketing strategy for most churches today, they, they figured out that the way to make your church the most inviting for sinners is to just not address their sin, to just ignore sin, to not talk about repentance, to not call sinners to repentance, but to make them comfortable in, in their sin. You do that, you, your church is going to be bursting at the seams. So Church Marketing 101 in 2019, the strategy is remove repentance from the salvation process. But if you want to model the true church, all you, gotta, you go back to Acts and you model that first church. You model that, that, uh, that early church. Acts 3.19, the first verse, the first word in Acts 3.19, Repent, therefore, and be converted. Why? that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of, of the Lord. Second Peter says, uh, it, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. So God Himself communicating very strongly the necessity of repentance. So godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, it says. Godly sorrow, again, it, it hurts. But it does such a great work in our lives that, that, that the pain is more than worth it. Not regret it, Paul says. But sorrow that does not produce what it was designed to do. Notice the sorrow of the world produces what? Death. Now we're just getting real. Here, take it or leave it. Truth of the Word. The kind of sorrow over sin... That's just, I'm sorry, but it doesn't lead to a change of course, a change of action, a turning away from the sin. A, a sorrow over sin that does not lead to repentance. You know what the problem with that is? It still leaves me in my sin. It hasn't provided me with any answer for sin. And so, if I'm on a path, and I'm walking straight ahead on that path, and at the end of that path is death, Unless I change my direction, how can I expect my destination to change? Verse 11, For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. They were convicted. They were filled with godly sorrow. And as a result, they repented. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong. I wasn't trying to call anyone out or embarrass anyone, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong. But the reason I wrote the letter, like any good, loving parent who loves their children, disciplines their children, he says that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. So very simply... Just want you to know how much I love you. And I want you to know how much God loves you, which is even more important. Therefore, verse 13, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. Now, can you imagine your Titus and Paul's giving you this letter, and, and you gotta take and deliver this harsh uh, in your face letter, you know, the scathing rebuke that, that, that Paul had, had written unto them. And now, Titus, here, Titus, can you take this to Corinth for me? And, and in Titus, in his mind, it, he had to be thinking, man, if they reject this letter, if they become angry or offended, if, if they reject this letter, I'm going to get caught in the crosshairs here. I mean, they're, gonna, they're probably going to come after me, you know, shoot the messenger kind of thing. And so, it's not only a great report, the fact that the Corinthians received Paul's letter with humility and, and repentant hearts. They also received Titus. They received Paul's messenger. And, and they comforted him and ministered to his needs. And so Titus comes to Paul, man. He's encouraged. Uh, he, he's refreshed. And rejuvenated. He, Titus, he comes to Macedonia and to Paul like he's just left a, a Calvary Chapel men's retreat. 
And Paul says, verse 14, For if anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. In other words, I don't know if Paul necessarily believed this in his mind, but the Holy Spirit revealed it to his heart. He believed it in his heart uh, when he sent Titus with that letter. You know, Paul was saying to, to, to Titus, you know, you, they're going to receive it. They're going to receive it. They're going to repent. And God is going to win in this situation. You just, you just watch, Titus. And, that, and that's exactly what happened. And so Paul says, my boastings about you, it turns out they were true. And his affection, speaking of Titus, are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all. How with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, Paul says, it's interesting, I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. Now, hold on a minute. (laughs) We just did 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians. We've gotten through 6 and and most of the 7th chapter in 2 Corinthians. And what a 180 that Paul just does here in, re- in regards to how he feels about this church in Corinth. How did he go from a place of such blistering reproof and, and rebuke, calling them out on everything from sexual immorality to, to, to drunkenness to false teaching to, to divisiveness, on one hand being friendly with sin in their church, but then on the other hand being you know, stingy with grace? Paul called them what equated to just a bunch of overgrown babies. How did he go from that to now, therefore I rejoice that I have confidence in you in all things? How did Paul so quickly get from one extreme to to the other as far as his view of the Corinthians? One word, repentance. They repented. That's how God sees you this morning. He looked down upon you. He calls you. You're, you're a sinner. You're heading in the wrong direction. You're a dead man. You're heading for hell. And then all of a sudden, one word, you repent. Godly sorrow leading to repentance, leading to salvation. And then God says, man, you're my boy. You're my girl. I got confidence in you in all things. It's because you had true repentance. Now, hopefully all of us are saved. All of us are going to heaven this morning. If you're not, man, I'd love to pray with you after service if you don't know the Lord. But but again, what this chapter is all about, the last two chapters, it's about greater intimacy with God, drawing closer to God, and drawing closer to God through this partnership with Him of Unyoking yourself from the world and seeking greater intimacy with Him through obedience. Walking away from the sin, doing that 180 and turning in the direction of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank You that Your throne is always open. That Your heart is always open to receive Your people even when we fall short even when we behave like the world. There you are with open arms to receive us, not just as friends, but as sons and daughters. Lord, you've examined all of the hearts in this room this morning, those who made the walk down to the altar, others And I pray, Lord, that you would help them to forsake all that is of the world and all that is of the flesh and that once and for all, Lord, you would deliver them from any sin, anything that has built a wall and caused them to go in the opposite direction of that which you find pleasing and that which is according to your statutes. As we come to your table this morning, Lord, to the communion table, I pray once again, Lord, that you would not allow us to come with dirty hands, but that you would cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that you would search our hearts, Lord, and that you would put upon our hearts that godly sorrow 
again, evidenced by a change of course, a change of action, evidenced by repentance. Help us to appreciate all that you did for us on the cross. Thank you for your body that was broken for our iniquities. Thank you for your blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. Bless that, Lord, which we are about to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, we are so thankful in this week of Thanksgiving that just passed, Lord, all that we have to be thankful for, not the least of which, your body and your blood that was broken, and your blood that was shed for us, Lord, facilitating godly sorrow, facilitating repentance, facilitating salvation. Lord, we ask that you would bless our week, that you would go with us, Lord, that you would give us an opportunity to be the hands and feet in the heart of Jesus, that you would give us an opportunity to be a light in a dark place, and that your word, everything that's spoken this morning, Lord, would not just sit on our ears, Lord, but it would sit on our hearts. It would penetrate us, Lord, even the marrow of our bones. God, would you bless us, watch over us, and Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've never accepted the Lord, again, if you just need prayer, I'd love to pray with you. Don't forget about uh, Ignite Youth tonight here at 6 p.m. This Wednesday, we will pick up our study in Exodus. I'll be in chapters 35 and 36. If you want to go ahead, read forward on that. Uh, next Sunday, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, so read forward on that as well. Let's all stand and, and we'll close. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Have a great week. God bless you. That's how you change the world. Thank you for listening to Change the World with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville. It is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus.